Good afternoon. I'm Michael Kimmich, Chair of the Kennan Institute's Advisory Council uh, and Professor at the Catholic University uh, of America. And I'm delighted to be not just initiating uh, what I know will be a fascinating conversation about Russian grand strategy, but launching a new series here at the Kennan Institute uh, titled The Long View. Uh, and just a few brief words about it. Uh, this is intended to be a step behind and beyond the headlines. Uh, it's also intended to be a chance to foreground first rate long form writing about Russia uh, and the region, US Russian uh, relations, and will hopefully be a forum for thinking creatively and in detail about uh, the challenges that face the US uh, under the rubric of US Russian relations uh, and uh, the sort of situation in the world uh, around those. Uh, around those challenges. In setting up this series, I'd like to thank Victoria Pardini, Morgan Jacobs, Will Pomerantz, uh, and Matt Rojanski, all of the Cannon Institute, uh, and to thank as well the Wilson Center staff uh, for making all of this uh, possible. Uh, if you have a question that you'd like to pose to our two uh, speakers today, who I'll introduce in just a moment, uh, you can send it via email to cannon at wilsoncenter.org uh, or via Twitter. Uh, hashtag Kennan Institute, uh, or via the Kennan Institute Facebook page, uh, or of course, uh, we can use the chat function of the conversation, I believe, uh, as well. But those are the, you know, sort of routes to asking a question. Uh, and it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, our two speakers who are the authors, uh, among others, um, of a really remarkable 200-page uh, report uh, on Russian grand strategy. Uh, reality and Rhetoric, uh, put out by the RAND Corporation, uh, and that is original, uh, you know, sort of refreshingly uh, precise uh, and rigorous, uh, and I think brings many new ideas to the table uh, for an understanding of Russian military strategy, foreign policy, and in turn, uh, new ideas to the table for how the U.S. should conceptualize uh, its strategy uh, and its policies toward uh, Russia. So Dara Masico uh, is a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation, an adjunct professor in Georgetown University's Security Studies Program, has pre previously served as a senior analyst for Russian military strategy and capabilities at the Department of Defense. Uh, and her work at RAND focuses on security issues in Russia and Eurasia, such as Russian military modernization, conflict and, conflict and force projection studies, escalation dynamics, and US force posture uh, and plans. Sam Cherup. Uh, is a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation from November 12th, uh, 2012 to April 2017. He was a senior fellow at, for Russia and Eurasia at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, prior to that, he was at the US Department of State, a senior advisor to the Under Secretary for Armed Control and International Security, serving as well on the Secretary's policy planning staff. Uh, his research interests include the political economy and foreign policies of Russia and former Soviet states, European and Eurasian regional security, US-Russia deterrence, strategic stability and arms control. So we're joined by two uh, wonderful experts uh, who I know have a lot to say. These will be their report and so I'll turn the floor over to them. They'll present their report for roughly 20 minutes uh, and then I'll start in with a few questions and then the floor will be open for uh, a general discussion of their ideas and insights. So over to you guys. Um, well, thank you uh, so much, Michael. I'm just going to share some slides here. I hope those are visible now. Yes. Yep. Uh, thank you so much, um, Michael, for uh, for the invitation um, and the uh, and the introduction. Um, we uh, we really appreciate the interest in the report. Um, this report, which uh, resulted from a project that Dara and I um, co-led, um, came out in. August. I should uh, caveat it by um, noting that uh, the research itself was finalized uh, significantly before that, um, so we didn't have the chance to incorporate uh, some of the developments in the last year and a half or so, um, and particularly the release of the new national security strategy, but I think you'll see that our findings um, hold up pretty well. Uh, the report, as uh, Michael mentioned is is uh, available uh, for download on the RAND website, um, and so I'll just go over. Uh, Dara and I will present uh, some of the main findings right now. Um, I'll uh, provide a little bit of introduction and some of the, uh, and then discuss some of our findings, and then I'll I'll hand it over to Dara uh, to take it from there. 
So um, we uh, tried to be a little bit precise about um, the concept of grand strategy um, in this report uh, and defined it um, uh, along the lines of, uh, you know, the way uh, contemporary political science uh, tends to uh, get into sort of more specifics about what uh, grand strategy means rather than having it be uh, broad categories. So. Um, we base our, our our definition on the on the on the Barry Posen um, quote that you see on your screen right now. Uh, but the bottom line here is that uh, this is about more than just a collection of foreign policies. That grand strategy is really about the logic, the underlying logic that explains a state's behavior, and that so it incorporates threat perceptions, it incorporates ideas about tools and objectives um, as well. And of course, uh, looking at Russian grand strategy, we uh, we argue is important for a number of reasons, um, and uh, primarily um, in the context of uh, having some degree of insight into where Russia is going in the future, um, and as a result, perhaps uh, to minimize the extent to which that kind of uh, where it is going comes as a surprise to anyone, uh, particularly in this context, U.S. decision makers. So we, our, our, our report addresses uh, three main research questions. First of all, what is Russia's stated grand strategy that is uh, as presented in both um, official strategy documents um, and other speech acts, such as senior leader statements and um, um, other documents and, and interviews that we did for this project. Uh, and then specifically, um, we sought to uh, ask the question about whether we could make the case that the actions of the Russian state that we observed empirically reflect what is stated on, on, on paper. Um, and then looking at the implications of that analysis for US policymakers. So we, um, we did a, what we considered at the time, at least an exhaustive review of um, of Russia's official strategy documents, statements from its leaders, and did a series of interviews. And through that, we outlined the contours of Russia's grand strategy. Um, and to put a long story short, um, uh, the, the basic narrative that comes through is that the, the Russian leaders believe that we are currently in a period of transition away from the sort of unipolar moment towards a more polycentric international system, power in that context is transitioning away from the West and towards the non-West. Um, this period of transition itself will be quite unstable, uh, they argue, um, and will be the source of a lot of friction. <clears throat> At the end of this process, though, um, the, the system will transition to something of a more, uh, to a more stable state whereby major powers will be the sort of leaders of their regions and have a degree of um, uh, autonomy, um, but also have the capacity to sort of uh, um, make deals according to their geopolitical weight. Um, this is neither, you know, not a endorsement of this uh, narrative. It is just simply in the report, and we get into obviously a lot more details about this. Um, the way Russia sees things going um, for as far as we can ascertain from uh, our review of the uh, of their prolific uh, writings and statements. Um, the point here that uh, uh, this is sort of how and Russia sees itself fitting in is where we where we decided to um, look more closely. And so what we did um, that's a big picture story. And obviously there are a lot more details in that big picture story. Um, but to get a little bit more granular, we picked six elements of that um, stated grand strategy um, and chose them based on how central they were to the overall strategy, how important they were for US interests, um, how active they were subject to discussion among scholars of Russia, and the broader policy community. Um, and uh, in a minute, I'll present them. Um, we are, uh, we, I, I'll, I'll present them in the order in which they repeat, appear in the report, but today we're gonna present them in the order in which uh, we led the, uh, the respective chapters. Uh, Dara, uh, given her uh, expertise, answered more for the, um, the, the, the military side of things. And I was looking more at the, the sort of foreign policy um, uh, piece. 
Uh, and so there were three chapters that were parts of the study that she led and three that I led. We're going to present four of those elements today um, for the sake of time, uh, but we're happy to go into detail about the others uh, in, the, in the Q&A. Um, so after we describe Russia's stated grand strategy, we assessed whether the stated grand strategy is reflected in behavior. Um, and this was the key sort of meat of the report. Um, the, the, the core of our work was developing hypotheses from the statements of grand strategy uh, about what corresponding actions we would see if those statements uh, or stated elements of grand strategy were true, and then testing to see if we can find empirical evidence to, um, to uh, bear those out. Um, so the, the six elements we looked at uh, uh, appear on your screen here, uh, at least the first three. Um, the, 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 the first relates to the interrelationship between domestic instability and interstate war. Um, the second is about Russia's objectives in its immediate neighborhood. Um, the third is about the kind of future wars that Russia envisions. Um, the fourth is about uh, the need for um, an extra, uh, an expeditionary military capability versus a more focused um, uh, military posture concentrated on um, Russia's periphery. The fifth relates to Russia's objectives vis-a-vis -vis the West. Um, and the sixth is about um, Russia's claim that not only is the power in the international system transitioning away from the West, but so too is Russia's political and economic focus. Um, so I will uh, now just describe um, in a little bit more detail uh, two of these uh, of our investigation of these six elements, and then I'll hand it over to Dara to present two more and, and the broader conclusions that we drew from our study. Um, so regarding Russia's uh, stated objectives of pursuing a benign leadership approach to his neighborhood, um, clearly that uh, that uh, benign um, adjective there is under, is uh, is belied by a lot of its activities in the in in vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine and Georgia particularly, but more broadly. Um, but what you see when you look a bit closer um, in terms of Russia's relations with the the all eleven of the non-Baltic former Soviet republics is that there is a huge amount of variation here. Um, and that Russia's relations with these states don't actually follow a single model, um, and that influence varies from country to country. Um, and we see a consistent pattern of coercion uh, being used to prevent um, defection, so to speak, to Western-led integration projects such as NATO and the EU. Um, but we also see cases, um, you know, for example, uh, Azerbaijan, where um, States resist Russia's uh, preferred economic uh, arrangements, or in the case of Uzbekistan, even withdraw from Russia-led security organizations, um, and they don't face the same kind of coercive uh, punitive um, consequences that, um, that those that sought uh, to quote unquote defect to Western-led integration pro pro uh, projects do. And so our, our conclusion here is that uh, the, the reality on the ground does not quite meet, match what um, Russia claims, um, but we don't see evidence of a sort of grand plan for uh, regional domination, um, which is often alleged. Instead, the uh, empirical evidence suggests that um, there's a degree of inconsistency and incoherence here. Um, that's perhaps the less charitable version. A more charitable one would be that uh, really, um, the relations with these countries varies from state to state, uh, and um, we don't see a sort of broad regional um, uh, approach, but rather a sort of differentiated one. Um, the second finding we're presenting in, that, in this talk today is about the, the pivot, um, and uh, you know Russia does claim that um, not only it, that that it needs to be focusing its attention um, much more so on the non-West rather than the West, and we try to find ways of actually seeing whether this plays out in practice because it's one thing to declare that it's another thing to actually uh, implement it. Um, and it's hard to um, document using existing data sets, um, sort of what countries are the most, uh, are, are the highest priority. Um, 
And so we created original data sets, basically, um, trying to document um, where Russia was putting its efforts in terms of engagement with uh, other governments and in terms of directing those parts of the economy that it can direct, um, uh, the government that is, uh, and how uh, comparing engagement with Western countries with those of non-Western countries. And one of the um, metrics that we came up with were these, um, at the bottom graph here, uh, intergovernmental commissions. And these are interagency um, uh, bilateral uh, commissions that um, meet, you know, are chaired by a minister, um, but involve a lot of essentially effort. And so we took this as a rough gauge of the sort of what, where Russia wants to be engaging. And obviously you see um, uh, a significant acceleration in terms of the prioritization of non-Western engagement after 2014. And of course the 2014 shock here um, did play a role, but that, that pattern um, had begun even before. We also looked at the, in the top graph, you can see um, the, uh, the international visits of um, line ministers, essentially, uh, not the foreign minister, um, but ministers like uh, the minister of industry, uh, the minister of agriculture, uh, the minister of energy, um, because those are essentially optional. These people don't have to travel, um, but where they do perhaps indicates uh, um, uh, a deliberate attempt to build relations. Um, and here you see a clear pattern as well. So what we did, what we found using these original data sets, and there are a few more um, in the text, is that we can really document the pivot in action, so to speak, with, with the sort of muscle movements of the state that match that um, broader strategic objective. And with that, I will hand it over to Dara. Thanks so much, Sam. Thanks, everybody, for having us today. My name is Dara Masico. I'm just going to briefly go through some of the military findings that we have and bring us home with conclusions, and then we can open it up to Q&A. So on this particular slide, we are talking about Russia's military posture is slightly divergent from the focus areas that they have on their official books of military strategy. So for this element, we wanted to look at what is the most likely form of warfare that Russia says that they need to be preparing for. And we wanted to see if behavior is matching what is what is written on the page. So Russia's official military strategy focuses on something called non-contact warfare. For those of you who are not familiar with this term, in a nutshell, it is a form of warfare that the United States has perfected. It is um, long range conventional precision strike in depth. It is different types of um, taking down of networks, um, different types in the Russian uh, viewpoint of this concept, um, destabilization behind enemy lines. What it is not, and what Russia explicitly states in their strategy, is that a large scale World War II force on force style of clash is increasingly unlikely in the 21st century. And further, that the aerospace domain, air and space, uh, are merging in their view, will be the center of gravity moving forward for modern warfare against a peer. So again, we did find a partial divergence here. And to evaluate the element, we looked at different elements of Russian force posture, procurement patterns over the last decade and moving forward to 2027. What's going on with mobilization? Where's the training emphasis? What's happening to the force structures themselves? And we found that although the stated strategy is still on the page, it is still talked about as a focus area and, and still important, um, particularly with conventional long range precision strike. These sectors today are comparatively less of a focus than they were initially envisioned over a decade ago. So we found that after 2014 in particular, although again, this shift did happen a few years before that, Russia has started reintroducing larger and more heavily armored formations back into the army, back into the airborne, back into the naval infantry that they had essentially stripped away or, or cut back significantly around 2009, 2010 as part of their new look reform program, as it was called at the time. Um, we find that uh, between that and their training exercises and what they're procuring, it reflects a shift away from small scale conflicts that they were anticipating or preparing for to something that is slightly larger. In their doctrine, it's called the regional echelon of warfare. And so that's essentially um, a small grouping of countries, not necessarily like 
block versus block Warsaw Pact versus NATO, not, not that echelon, but the one right beneath it. And so we wanted to look also at um, what can we derive about their priorities from where they're putting their forces. And if force posture enhancements are any clue of Russian priorities, and in, in my experience as a force follower, they tend to be, um, it's clear that having more forces, whether that's ground forces or air forces, um, and Navy as well, uh, in particular near Ukraine is important. We've seen a lot of shift in that direction over the last few years. Um, secondarily, I would say near Belarus also, um, with reinforcing Northwestern Russia, and Kaliningrad, uh, the second order priority there, but still closely behind. What we're not seeing from their behavior is that any evidence in how much they are procuring, what they're procuring, the essentially inert status of their mobilization system, um, their defense industrial base, orders of battle, manning plans, all of that kind of converges and is telling us that they will not structurally be able to support a protracted, conventional, large-scale war for territorial acquisition, um, like a, a World War II kind of a front-style uh, warfare. It's, it's just not in the strategy and it's not in the force structure. So an implication of that being, are we going to see a potential shift next time they update their doctrine? They're about seven or eight years um, uh, in the past from doing that. Will we start to see a greater emphasis on these larger scale clashes than initially envisioned? Um, next slide, please. And then uh, the final one that we'll go into today, we, we have some tucked in the backups as well. Um, Russian strategy does not articulate a clear need for an expeditionary military force other than its nuclear triad, which of course maintains its, its global reach. In our study, we defined expeditionary out of area operations as um, operations that require transit to a country that is not contiguous with Russia. So, you know, something in Ukraine, something in Tajikistan, that's still regional power projection. But if you're starting to consider Syria or Afghanistan or one of those, that's that would be um, in our definition, um, an expeditionary operation. And we do find a match here. Um, Russia's strategy is matching what we're seeing in terms of behavior. And we evaluated their structure, both present and future, for three key pillars needed to support an expeditionary force. High readiness, high sustainability, and mobility. And we find that uh, these are really requisite areas for an expeditionary along the lines of what the United States has configured or the Soviet Union had uh, way back and some of our NATO allies. And so for Russia, these three pillars are fragile or lacking altogether in these crucial areas. So um, in readiness, um, even though Russia has made great strides, there are still persistent effort, um, excuse me, persistent issues with equipment serviceability. Manning also is also an issue, both from some aspects of undermanning to their mixed manning system that makes it very difficult to project forces uh, abroad for this purpose if not everybody is highly trained or if you're a conscript. And then sustainability, Russia does not have that network of forward bases anymore. They don't have the logistics that are ready made to support these kinds of things. They've been making efforts in Africa and other places, but for some reason it's not sticking. They just can't seem to get it over the line. Um, and they don't really have a modular force structure. Um, in fact, their traditional rapid reaction forces, even like the airborne and others, they're becoming heavily armored, more clunky, more difficult to transit, um, transport over time. So um, how can we explain then essentially what Russia is doing in Syria? Uh, that is a very limited force size. At max, we were looking at three to 5,000 individuals. That's, that's a very small operation. It did not stress their logistics. Um, it, it is an ad hoc, uh, sort of a makeshift kind of expeditionary capability that cannot necessarily be replicated anywhere. Russia does not have allies that it can call upon to support it in theater. They do have people that they can base from, but that's about the extent of the capability that's provided even by CSTO allies or, or the SCO. But I think it's important here to remember that Russia is capable of assembling this kind of force. They are creative in how they do it, but there are so many places globally that they cannot go that they simply don't have these ingredients to do. Um, so we can go forward to the next slide and we can talk about some of the observations from the report. There's too many to fit into our presentation today, so we just want to give you some of the highlights. And so when we looked at comparing the strategy 
there's stated grand strategy versus the behaviors that we can identify, we do find that there, it's generally a, a reliable predictor of the state's efforts. Their grand strategy has very, very specific and yet also lofty ambitions as most strategy documents tend to have. Uh, but you know, Russia's ability to implement that is a little bit more experimental. Sometimes it's ambiguous and, and reactive, frankly. Um, speaking of reactive, we found uh, a narrative that appeared through our analysis that uh, the Maidan revolution in 2014 was an exogenous shock to Russia. It can account uh, for many divergences that we found between stated strategy and demonstrated behavior. And they've reacted to that crisis um, and the breakdown with the West in particular in, in ways that have not been beneficial for its long-term strategic goals. Um, or it's causing them to diverge in, in multiple ways. Uh, Russia is resource constrained. And uh, you know, we do find that their, la their insufficient economic resources and even political capital in regions where they're supposed to be um, quite strong or quite dominant um, really are limiting their ability to fully realize their objectives. Um, they do face those challenges and they do face opposition to their plans and they have to constantly reassess and try to move forward. Um, and we also find that in the strategy there, in, in the architecture that they have, they do prioritize threats and there is a bit of a logic there. But if you're going to prioritize, then you, know, you have to be able to accept risk in some areas. And we found um, through looking at their behavior is that the Kremlin is not really willing to accept that risk. There's a pervasive sense of insecurity and they need to create buffers against multiple thread directions, basically from every, every direction, every domain. Um, so essentially what that does to them is it prevents optimal resource allocation and it constrains already limited uh, resources that they have. Um, but the big foot stomp here for our report is that their revealed grand strategy, um, what we can deduce from their actions and where they're putting their money, where they're putting their forces, where they're putting their efforts and energy, it's not fundamentally divergent from their stated strategy. And our next slide, please. This is our last one. Um, so I mean, this may not be a surprise, but strategic competition will remain the most intense around Russia's post-Soviet Eurasian periphery. Although as Sam pointed out, their approach and influence to that region does vary from country to country. They can use multiple forms of coercion up to and including military coercion as we've seen them do if need be, um, but not to impose total control, but ultimately for the goal of preventing its neighbors from integrating into rival economic and, and security blocks. And as Sam has shown um, that Russia is moving away from the West polit politically and economically as they look for future like-minded partners um, in multiple parts of the globe from the Asia Pacific to Africa to South America, uh, just really Middle East all over the place. And so as alluded to before uh, in the military realm, the Russian defense budget is relatively stagnant. Um, we just got an update a week ago that maybe that is going to be changing a little bit, but not fundamentally from where they are. Uh, they are trying to essentially maintain a superpowers portfolio of tools and be on the leading edge of things like hypersonics and nuclear weapons, but they have a very constrained budget. And they are trying to put all their eggs into different baskets for stability, but what that does is it limits their forward momentum. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I think, that, I think that's, I thought we had one more, but we don't. Um, but so I will end there. Um, this is our phenomenal research team. Um, we, our report is available on the RAND website. We have a link. Um, I hope you follow all of our researchers. We really enjoyed putting this together. At this point, I'll turn it back over to you, Michael, for any questions. Terrific. Thank you so much, Dara and, and, and Sam for the presentation and of course for the report as well. Uh, to mention, um, the best way to ask questions I had said a moment ago, you could use the chat function that was rhetoric. The reality is that you can use Twitter, which somebody has done uh, already. You can also use email, canon at wilsoncenter.org, or you can use the Canon Institute Facebook page if anybody has a question. I know that we have at least one sort of waiting, uh, one question waiting in the wings, but I wanna ask two questions of my own before opening the floor to the, uh, to the broader audience. And I'll ask them both together and, you know, you can just respond to whichever pieces of them uh, interest you most. And the first is, is, is about something that's not really in the report. Um, you use the phrase, Sam, often alleged uh, that Russia is doing, you know, sort of something. And, and you wanted to look into the reality of things as best you could scrutinize it. Um, 
But I want to ask about Western misperceptions of Russian grand strategy, what maybe some of the prevalent ones are, um, and uh, you know, sort of how you think about these now that you've done all of this uh, research and have arrived at uh, what really does feel like a more precise rendering uh, of the uh, of the subject. And so that's question number one about common misperceptions and and, and perhaps the danger of uh, of some of these misperceptions. And then secondly, uh, I want to ask a question that's you know, sort of, uh, I think of, of real concern to uh, American policy or, or to sort of Euro-American policy on Russia. Uh, and this is about Russia's shift uh, to the non-West uh, uh, as you define it, and you offer evidence for this and you know, ministerial visits and economic policy. Uh, and so I can think of three ways that you can understand this for, for, for Western policy. And one is an opportunity cost, which is something that you have to factor in. There are these tensions between Russia and the West. and sort of so be it, uh, if that's the course that they're setting for themselves. Another way would be that this is inevitability because of you know, regime affiliation between Russia and China, uh, because Russia does have a sort of uh, enormous uh, Asian border territory, et cetera. So it's just gonna go in that direction anyway, regardless of what we would do. Uh, and then a sort of third option, which is that this is a real strategic concern that this might have uh, you know, sort of very negative effects. And of course, these three ways of looking at this shift uh, would have implications for the kind of policy that's set uh, toward Russia. So misperceptions uh, and the shift away from the West. I don't know if, if, I, if one of you wants to start before the other, or uh, I'll just sort of let you jump in as, as, as you best see fit. Yeah, I, no, just one thing I'll say about the misperceptions um, of Russian grand strategy from our end. Uh, so we've, we've run across the point of view that oh, Russian grand strategy is not really what they're doing and they have this sort of nefarious shadow strategy and Russian grand strategy, their strategy documents are reflexive control to try to get us to do things. And we didn't really find that empirically to be the case. Now we didn't look at each and every single thing that we're doing, um, but even if you look at some of the things that they traditionally do in the shadows, like, um, you know, with disinformation campaigns or some of their operatives abroad or PMCs, uh, all of those things can be essentially in service to goals that are articulated in the strategy, like breaking away from the West, making sure that there's certain parts of their behavior that they're not gonna be good at anymore. They won't get the support for anymore, like regime change. So I, I think that was the biggest takeaway for me is that even though there are shadowy actors in, in the Kremlin, um, I, we didn't find in our report that there's a fundamentally different, you know, shadow side of what they're doing. Thanks. Um, yes, I think that's exactly right. And basically one of the, you know, big picture takeaways is pay attention to what they say, because usually it's not some elaborate maskirovka or something like that, some attempt to, uh, to pull one over there, they at least telegraph what they're going to try to do um, most of the time. Um, and that's important. I think in, in certain um, uh, of the case studies, so to speak, the looking at the more the specific elements, we, we had, you know, multiple um, that is, this, there's a sort of common Western uh, analytical narrative that you could use as, as another source of hypotheses about how what Russian behavior would look like if it were, uh, if, the, if that narrative were in fact true. So in the case of the pivot, the, there is a, at least a strand in Western analysis that says it's all baloney. Uh, it's just an attempt to sort of extort um, or to use, to, to use um, the West the non-West against the West to sort of um, uh, to to generate to somehow generate uh, jealousy um, uh, by uh, on behalf of Western powers in order to modify our position towards Russia so as to prevent that uh, that engagement with the non-West um, and you know that, that's a nice foil to what they say and then you can sort of look and see well okay the 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 narrative is. Uh, X, the Russian claim is the opposite. Where does, what is the, what does the data tell us? Um, and I think that's an important exercise to engage in because, you know, claims that where you don't have that kind of empirical basis um, are basically just, um, uh, you know, opinions. Um, 
So uh, the the uh, question you asked about the transition to the non-West, uh, it's we we certainly don't get into that in the report. Um, so I wouldn't want to stray too far from the text here. Um, I think part of it this is uh, inevitable. Um, we saw, I mean, the fact that 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 a lot of this was evident before 2014 suggests to me that Russia would be trying to do some of this, regardless of what the nature of the relationship with the West is at the moment. Um, and frankly, so is the rest of the world, right? Um, you know, I think the 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 idea that that power is transitioning and that, you know, like rising powers in places like Asia, um, uh, above and beyond China, but including China, are are the sort of geopolitical center of gravity for the 21st century. That's not like a controversial view, even in Washington. Um, so um, I think uh that um you know that having been said that uh, there's uh an extent to which that sort of precipitous drop off was a function of um western policy for better or worse I mean, you can say it was the right thing to do but there was a deliberate uh, um policy of no longer no more business as usual right um and uh i think you know basically we should just be aware that there are that might might have been the right decision, but there, are, of course, are consequences. Those are not cost-free decisions, um, and I think that's at least based on what the what we our findings are that uh, I would feel confident um, empirically stating. Wonderful. Well, I'm delighted to see that we have six questions from the audience. So what I'll do is I'll ask um, on behalf of our questioners in groups of two, uh, so that you can. Um, you know, sort of again, pick and choose what you wish to respond to uh, and so that you don't get uh, uh, overwhelmed with questions. So to take the first two in turn, uh, Professor uh, Defer-Britz of Howard University, and please excuse me if I mispronounced your uh, name, asked, where does Latin America fit uh, in this non-West uh, paradigm? Uh, and then a second question from Chris Bort, could you elaborate on the strategic goal that Russia does not seek to weaken the West, it rather seeks selective cooperation? Adds, I'm sympathetic to the argument that Russia does not seek to weaken the West just for the sake of weakening it. It seeks to weaken the West in order to achieve the dialogue of equals it seeks. How would you uh, assess that point? So uh, back, to, back to you, our speakers. So uh, I, on that last point, I should just be clear that when we had those uh, six statements that uh, that Chris refers to in his question, those are what Russia claims. Um, and that's not an endorsement necessarily of what they claim. Those were uh, claims that we tried to test. And in the case of the um, uh, doesn't seek to weaken the West, um, uh, Chris, we find exactly what you state. And there's a good amount of evidence, even in, you know, the um, in open sources that uh, in fact, it seeks precisely that. And we came up with a way of trying to differentiate between, uh, or trying to, yeah, be, be able to delimitate activity that clearly could be con seen as uh, an attempt to weaken the West. Um, however, our sort of uh, one way of making sense of it is precisely the explanation that you give that basically it's about um, trying to achieve cooperation on Russian terms via. Uh, methods that clearly undermine um, the, uh, the the political willingness of Western governments to do so because they are so aggressive. Um, but that that's a sort of interpretation. Um, the point is, I think that the, there isn't a um, uh, a match between the stated strategy and the empirical reality we found on that point. Uh, where does Latin America fit in? Uh, it is it, we in our sort of categorization of countries as Western and non-Western. I think. You know the vast majority of those countries fall into the non-Western camp. Uh, it, they are mentioned in the um, list of new, particularly Brazil as a new center of power is is talked about a lot. Um, and uh, you know I think we've seen um, uh, Russian engagement throughout um, Latin America as um, uh, in in this context, but. Um, I, I think it is fair to say that those, they aren't as prominent in the narrative about power transitions, uh, with the exception of Brazil, perhaps, as um, uh, Asia Pacific and uh, Middle East uh, powers are. Um, but it certainly is part of the picture for sure. Uh, 
Dara, would you like to jump in? All right, uh, so we'll start with Dara and with the next, uh, with the next pair of questions. Um, uh, and the first in this round comes from Karen Siegel, former diplomat. What about private Russian military forces such as the Wagner Group and the controversial use of such forces in places like Mali? How does this fit in with the overall Russian strategy? How much coordination might there be at the strategic level? And then secondly, from Justin Tomchik, what role do projects like the Eurasian Economic Union play in Russian grand strategy? And what can this tell us about Russia's engagement? with the near abroad. So Dara, we'll start with you this time around. Sure, thank you. Um, I'll take a stab at the, the mercenary question and the PMC question. So one of the things that we um, discussed in the conclusion of our report is that, you know, while Russia is not looking at uh, a US or even a resuscitated Soviet model of power projection or influence projection, they are using these other tools to project their influence and, and shape events internationally. So if you want to think about it as a, a different kind of expeditionary triad, you could think of one with mercenaries, um, use of intel operatives abroad to do different types of tasks and activities in the gray zone. Uh, Russia has been using these, a uh, combination of them all over Africa. They've been um, using them allegedly in Ukraine. They've been using part of them in Europe. They've been using aspects of them in Venezuela and other parts of South America as well. So it's... Um, it's, it is consistent with uh, Russian national security strategy thinking and military strategy in general. If you think about how often they discuss non-military measures, um, I find that the, the Russian discussion and assessment of how the United States uses um, you know, different types of groups, um, like uh, you know, what was formerly known as Blackwater, uh, they ascribe motives and tasks to these groups that in some ways are mirror imaging what their own PMCs are doing um, abroad. But I think the important thing to remember is that you know, these groups are illegal inside Russia. And so what you find is the brass won't discuss it. The brass can't discuss it, uh, whether that's the Kremlin, whether that's uh, the military. So um, you know, in sum, I, I think that it's not inconsistent with how they're trying to undermine certain types of uh, the Western liberal order they use these these tools. Um, they're trying to carve out influence for themselves and be seen as a service provider in different parts of the world, maybe where the United States is not, um, or start chipping away at our influence. So um, even though um, mercenaries aren't articulated in the strategy, the use of them is still in service of these larger goals. Thanks. Um, so on the Eurasian Economic Union, we, we look uh, pretty closely at um, the varying uh, engagements with the Eurasian Economic Union of the um, 11 uh, former Soviet republics. Um, it's worth noting that seven of the 11 are not members. Um, and uh, the, uh, but that having been said, of course, clearly the Eurasian Economic Union is, is that is at the center of Russia's regional integration efforts. Um, arguably, it's more dynamic than the, than the security uh, umbrella organization, the CSTO, um, and uh, certainly more um, institutionally um, uh, strong, uh, has more uh, uh, authorities delegated to it by its members. Um, what, what I think is interesting in the context of the report is, uh, so countries that decided, opted not to go that way, um, some of them, uh, well, one of them, Armenia was sort of coerced into to joining. Um, uh, Georgia and Moldova and Ukraine, of course, all chose to sign DCFTAs, Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreements with the EU, which makes the Eurasian Economic Union membership impossible. Um, of course, we know that the uh, in the case of Ukraine, Russia has demonstrated over the course of seven years of uh, armed aggression that uh, it was not okay with that choice. Um, and uh, but in the case of Georgia and Moldova, although um, in the Georgian case sanctions were threatened for signing the DCFTA, and in the Moldovan case they were um, temporarily implemented, at the moment both of them have DCFTAs and. Um, 
trade regimes with Russia that um, you know are, are not restricted. Um, and that's just interesting in that it, it, it suggests that Russia's um, bottom line with these countries differs from country to country. It's, it wasn't okay for Armenia to sign a DCFTA, but it is okay for, uh, or at least it's a, you know uh, acceptable, or at least they're not gonna do that much to stop Georgia from and Moldova from doing that. And they're prepared to go to extreme lengths to prevent Ukraine from um, uh, making that a reality. Thanks so much. So two further questions, and we have right now a rather long list of uh, questions. So just uh, um, be forewarned, uh, our, our two speakers. So from Edward Levine, uh, I wonder whether given Russia's limited economic resources, it's planning on using nuclear weapons as a poor state substitute for sustainable conventional forces in a regional or larger war. How does it integrate nuclear and conventional force elements in its strategy and actions? Question number one, and then number two from Daryl Staniford. Russia's pursuit of the six elements of the grand strategy that you described are all based on the foundation of having a strong, stable state, uh, legitimate government, et cetera. The majority of Russia's foreign policy strategy is focused on supporting that goal. Russia cannot be a great power without a strong, stable government and not being treated as a great power will undermine the legitimacy of the government and the system. How does the state of affairs impact Russia's grand strategy? So back to you. I can, I can start with that one. So uh, first on the, the nuclear question, to, to pick up on something as uh, using nuclear weapons as a way to sort of um, save costs to, Contributed to deterrence. There is a, and we go into this in the report, there is a, in recent years, growing recognition that the, the type of war that the United States fights with lots of tomahawks and jasms and these kind of things, um, that is a very expensive way to fight. Uh, those missiles are expensive. The C4ISR architecture is expensive. The force posture that you need for that, the forward basing that you need for that. Uh, the, the Russian general staff is beginning to understand just how expensive that is. I think part of that is um, seeing firsthand how many missiles we expend when we are actioning targets in Syria. They're there, they can, they can do their own assessments uh, and they have their own calculations that they're running. So, you know, you see them not walk back the concept of non-contact warfare, but you do see them say out loud, you know, this is, this is, um, there's a reason why not everybody can do this, and that's because it is very resource intensive. So Russia has designed a whole strategy to asymmetrically defeat someone who's stronger than them. And they often, you know, that means the United States is the planning factor. So um, nuclear weapons are a component of that, strategic and non-strategic. They haven't given those up. There's no plan to do so. Uh, they are developing weapons, and you know, some people call them the super weapons. I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't call them super weapons, but they are things like Sercon, um, things like Burvestnik that are very conceptual. Those are designed with a specific point in mind. Um, they're designed in many ways to go underneath, through, over uh, ballistic missile defense. So rather than create Russia's own BMD architecture, and this is, I'm making an asymmetric point, um, the expense needed to create their own BMD architecture against um, a US style shock and awe campaign against them is prohibitively expensive. So what they've essentially decided to do is come up with cheaper solutions to um, negate key parts of our capability. So I, I think there is a cost saving um, part of their strategy, certainly. Um, it's not all being borne by the nuclear forces, it's being borne by other things. And to your second question, um, we spent, um, we, we cut it out of our briefing today, but we do have it in the backups. Um, but there is an entire chapter in the report on the relationship that is um, fundamentally important to Russia about having a stable home front. And um, they devote significant resources to maintaining domestic stability in a way that is not familiar um, to the United States. So, you know, they have their own internal military. It's now called the National Guard and it was made of multiple chunks of things. Um, predecessor organizations, they fund it lavishly. For a while um, in our period of study, it was actually um, funded um, in that bucket of the national budget, um, typically uh, very robustly. So um, 
you know, this is a focus to them. Um, it is, it's a focus to try to monitor and control what's happening on the internet, try to monitor and control what's happening on the ground. But um, fundamentally, even though they, they may have desires, Russia is not a police state. Um, they have a lot of different threats that they have to um, prepare for. And that's, that's abroad and at home. And, and they're really trying to strike a balance from, from the behaviors that we can see. Sam, anything you'd like to add? All right. So I think what we'll do is two more rounds of questions. So two more, and then what I see in the in the queue is is a, a round of three to uh, to conclude. And these are all in and of themselves rather ambitious questions. So question: the next question has been broken by the questioner Alex Shikoff into three pieces. Uh, so keep your pen handy. The report mentions Russia is pivoting its international political and economic focus toward what it calls new centers of power. How much is it driven by strategic calculations or has been forced to do this by the EU and its shutting of doors post invasions of Georgia and Ukraine? How, how is Russia balancing that with growing Chinese economic clout and are Central Asian states re reacting to Russia's leadership ambitions? How much deterrence given Russian interpretations of the concept, how much deterrence uh, how does deterrence contribute to Russian grand strategy? And lastly, in the spirit of George Kennan, his writings, how does Russian grand strategy compare to what Kennan described in the long telegram? I'm not quite sure if I can follow that last uh, point, but uh, um, that's the first. Uh, and then from Anne Daly, second question, did you look or see anything regarding Russia's perception of the Arctic in its grand strategy? American security officials have emphasized Russia's security buildup in the Arctic as an indicator not only of their goal to secure the Russian Arctic, but an unstated goal to project power from the region. Did you find any indicators of this uh, in your research? Sam, shall we start with you this time and then uh, go over to Dara? Sure, um, I would just, we don't have a separate chapter on Arctic uh, elements of Russian grand strategy. That's not to say they don't exist. It's just to say that we picked six pieces and you know basically tried to take digestible bites and apply the same approach to it that is generating uh, hypotheses about expected behavior and then trying to see if we could um, uh, see those uh, uh, concrete behaviors um, you know, play out. Uh, in the real world, um, uh, not to diminish the importance of the Arctic. So uh, shutting of doors versus a, w whether the pivot to the, away from the West is a function of the shutting of doors versus a deliberate um, uh, policy from what I recall uh, was the first question. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, basically there's evidence that uh, there's a, uh, the efforts predated the shutting of doors. Um, so we have evidence, at least from 2012, uh, that, that some of these um, attempts to shift engagement were already occurring. Um, but clearly, uh, 2014 and the uh, decision um, to, uh, you know, uh, end a lot of institutional and, and bilateral intergovernmental engagement with Russia accelerated the trend that we see in the in the. Um, in the data about ministerial visits and intergovernmental commission meetings and so on. Um, the, uh, it was hard to, to pick apart the other questions, but I'll, I'll take one bit of it. How does a Russian understanding of deterrence fit into all of this? So if you take what Russia, um, how Russia understands the word uh, in Russian for that's translated as deterrence, namely Zdzierżowanie, um, I think it actually helps you understand what they're up to when it comes to uh, um, their objectives vis-a-vis -vis the West. One way of translating that, which is different from the English root, is, is to cause restraint, to cause another actor to be more restrained. Um, and uh, if, in fact, as uh, both Chris Bort and uh, the report suggests that some of these efforts to um, weaken uh, Western countries are, in fact, to um, to change their behavior to cause them to be more restrained vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, that sort of does fit in with uh, with you know deterrence concept as Russia understands them. Although I think again the translation of the word is so problematic that it's probably not even worth using in this context. But 
Um, Russia certainly wants to take actions to cause the West to be more restrained. That's for sure. Aaron, anything you wanted to contribute to that, that set of questioning? Okay, well, um, here are three concluding questions. And if you don't mind folding your concluding thoughts and remarks into your answers to these questions, that would be, uh, that would be our uh, ideal, uh, our ideal scenario. So the, the first from William Woods, could you elaborate if Russia has taken a more hands-off approach to shape international influence or whether it's been in close collaboration with China? Uh, how does the Russian campaign to sell nuclear power plants in the non-West fit into its grand strategy, asked Jay Kramer. Uh, and then from Bill Barry, do you see any signs that the Russian Federation is prioritizing military space capabilities? Do they see enough risk in this field to actually make scarce resource allocations to space support and or weapons capabilities. So from space to the Arctic, uh, to the five continents of the earth, um, uh, uh, you have your work cut out for you in, 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 in characterizing Russian grand strategy in response to these last three questions. I'll you know, sort of leave it up to you as to who uh, jumps in first and who gets, the, who gets the last word as it were. That is, um, that is a very expansive uh, question, uh, terrestrial and extraterrestrial. Well done <laughs> to um, our, our questioner. Uh, so um, we didn't necessarily look at the, the Russia-China relationship in our report. However, um, Russia does uh, state explicitly multiple times in its different strategy documents that they are seeking a comprehensive relationship with China they are trying to build coalitions of like-minded countries that serve as a counterweight to the Western liberal order, um, the, essentially the view of the world that the United States is currently uh, a part of. Um, but we didn't look at um, synchronized behavior uh, of the two um, necessarily, and Sam can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, likewise, with, with nuclear power plant selling um, abroad, but you know, Sam and I have both been part of a project that, that looked at uh, Russian activity in Africa, and, and that is that is a tool that Russia has to try to curry influence there, um, and it's one that they are using. Um, in terms of space capabilities, I can we again we didn't focus on that in the paper, but I can tie it into what we did talk about. Um, so Russia does have um, interesting concepts for counter space, and they have resourced those things. They don't talk about them very much. So it's a little hard to evaluate them um, in the context of this project. But again, if you're, if you're looking back at the notion of asymmetry and trying to find um, them trying to find ways to weaken us in a, in a conflict, uh, in a non-contact war in particular, uh, they know that we are highly dependent on our architecture. And so they've come up with sort of ingenious plans to try to disable or degrade that at multiple rungs of the escalation ladder. And they've thought about this for, for quite some time. Um, their challenges, of course, are the, the resourcing question. Uh, for a, a while there in the early 2000s, and even frankly up until 10 years ago, uh, this, their space-based constellation was in real trouble. And they had to devote a significant chunk of efforts to rehabilitating that. And they're not yet where they want to be. Uh, Syria proved that to them, that if they're really going to go all in on long range strike, they need a little bit more up there in terms of their C4ISR architecture. Um, so um, I, will, I will turn it over to, to Sam to answer the other aspects of, of that question. Thank you. Um, Two quick comments. Uh, one is just to say, I think what I, the way I understood that first question was about the extent to which Russia is acting independently or in concert with China and international for or something along those lines, Michael, is that more or less? So, you know, one thing that's important to underscore both um, as uh, what that, well, let me put it this way. One thing that Russia underscores in its uh, state of grand strategy is that, is that it will be a, you know, independent center of power. It does not envision itself as um, China's, you know, junior partner. Uh, it envisions itself as one of the major powers that will be leading its, you know, be a regional leader um, up there with China. Uh, and therefore, you know, I think it sees China as a peer um, in the international system, one of the major powers uh, that will be, you know, increasing its uh, relative 
power vis-a-vis -vis the West and uh, have a greater role. But that does not mean, you know, that, uh, I mean, I, I think, therefore, we can take away from that, that coordination of all its positions with China is not something that Russia sees as, uh, uh, you know, great powers certainly consult, but they don't, um, you know, they don't necessarily, well, they, by definition, they're not going to be taking on the positions of other powers in the system, uh, you know, unless there's a deal to be had. Um, uh, so the Ross, so that the, the question about nuclear power plants actually got me thinking because uh, you know we looked in trying to look at um, state directed economic activity, we picked um, certain state owned corporations, and in this case it was Gazprom, Rosneft, um, uh, Sparebank, and the Russian Direct Investment Fund and looked over the course of the 2012 to 2018 period at where they were signing memoranda of understanding and uh, engaging in you know, um, joint investment projects and so on. Um, and Ross Adam is, you know, uh, the, that is the, the, the state entity that answers for, among other things, um, building nuclear power plants abroad um, uh, is you know, clearly subject to the same kind of probably um, uh, could be subject that is to the same kind of pressures we assumed or that is influences policy influences that we assume the state owned or state controlled economic entities that we did look at um, are uh, subject to. In other words, you know, the, the Russian state has a much uh, has a sort of policy lever that it uh, can pull as the majority shareholder of Gazprom and deciding what Gazprom uh, where it, which pipelines it might um, build in the future. Uh, and certainly with the Sovereign Wealth Fund, that's also the case. Um, now, the challenge with Ross Adam is that the nuclear power plant market is so not really a market, right? I mean, you know, there are relatively few opportunities. Uh, and so I think Ross Adam seems to be taking whatever it can get, wherever it can get it, uh, and wants to be building, you know, nuclear power plants essentially wherever a host government will agree to its conditions to, to, to do it. So, um, but I'd be interested to, to look into that data more closely and see if there are in fact are trends um, uh, as to where they are building them um, and where the contracts are being signed. Wonderful. Well, um, you know, we've come to the, uh, the end of the hour almost uh, perfectly on time. I thank you for showing uh, chronological restraint uh, in your answers to these questions and, and having been so succinct, but at the same time um, for the, the depth and precision of your uh, insight. Uh, I'm sure a Kennan Institute audience has already read this report carefully, but uh, uh, for those who uh, haven't necessarily, um, uh, it's 100% it's, uh, worth reading and also worth uh, uh, recommending and, and studying carefully. And uh, we're, we're honored to have had the two of you uh, with us this afternoon, uh, and uh, uh, we're delighted to have featured your, uh, your terrific report. Let me just offer a few final closing remarks. Um, uh, from the Kennedy Institute's perspective, if you want to keep up with upcoming events and publications, uh, please uh, tune into uh, uh, podcasts as well, uh, Canon X and the, uh, the Russia file. Um, uh, you can also find latest Kennedy Institute analysis of events in Russia and the region on the Russia file and Focus Ukraine uh, blogs. Let me put in a pitch here by way of, uh, of conclusion for the next two events, which I think will pair nicely sort of in sequence with this one. Uh, on the 4th of November, Kathleen Stoner will speak uh, 1 to 2 p.m. on her published book, um, uh, Russian Resurrection. Uh, and on December 10, from 12 noon to 1 p.m., Timothy Fry will speak on his uh, recently published book, Weak Strongman, The Limits of Putin's Russia. So if you want to figure out whether Russia is res resurrecting or struck in, stuck in some, uh, some condition of, uh, of weakness and strength, please tune in for our next two events. Thanks again, Sam and Dara, for uh, joining us today and see all of you uh, next time. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.